All right. So today I'd like to introduce this concept uh, or construct called the Jhana matrix. And it's really quite simple. It's just a way of modeling on a two by two kind of grid, two dimensions of jhanic experience or two, two dimensions that I think are important to talk about as we engage in the practice of jhana, particularly as we figure out what kind of jhana it is that or, or jhanas that we're trying to cultivate. Uh, I think there are actually a lot of options here and the optionality is not always clear. Uh, and as a result, if you start to practice in a tradition or in a, a community or whatever with a teacher uh, that has a view that doesn't include the full matrix, then you just by default will end up practicing their view or their vision of what jhana is. Here, I want to try to zoom out a little bit. I'm not saying this is the total vision and view, the over hyper over meta view or anything. Just saying it's a, I think it's a little bit more zoomed out than most uh, models that talk about jhana are. Uh, at this point. So I think hopefully it'll be helpful for you. Um, so yeah, let me just present here the jhana matrix. So this is a uh, basic modeling of the jhana matrix, just a simple two by two grid, as I said. And on the vertical axis, we'll start off uh, with the vertical axis here. This is the depth axis. So this is one I think is probably more familiar, um, this dimension. For, for a lot of people. Although to be honest with you, I didn't become aware of this dimension until I started working with Kenneth Folk and Daniel Ingram, two of my earliest teachers. And they made this really, I think, great point, which is that all these people are arguing about jhana and what constitutes jhana. And is that a valid or real or legit experience of jhana? And you'd have people from like the, you know, these are all different Buddhist lineage camps, uh, people from the Pa'ak uh, camp, arguing with people from the Mahasi camp, arguing with people from, you know, anyway, are all arguing about what constitutes a real jhana. And what uh, Kenneth and Daniel pointed out is that really what they're arguing about is something that actually exists on a spectrum. So what is the spectrum? Well, it's a spectrum going from soft to hard, or you could say from light to intense. And, um, Brian Newman, who's going to be joining us next week as a, a new teacher here in the Jhana community, part of his experience and what he describes is doing Jhana training in a tradition where it's extremely hard, okay? The, the type of Jhana that he trained in, in order for it to be a legitimate attainment, meaning you actually got Jhana, you have to be able to sit for three hours on the dot. You have to actually set an intention to enter and exit the Jhana three hours later, you close your eyes, you enter into the jhana, your body dissolves, thoughts dissolve, everything dissolves. And then three hours later on the dot, you exit out of the jhana. You look down at your clock, three hours. I nailed it. And you have to do that with all the jhanas. <laughs> you have to be able to show that you can move through all the jhanas in that, at that level of depth. So that's extremely hard jhana. On the soft side, I think all of us here have experienced soft jhana. Well, I'll claim whether or not you can recognize the pattern of jhana is another question, but have you experienced it? I'd say almost certainly everyone here has experienced some form of a soft jhana. Uh, my teacher, Kenneth Folk, he uses this analogy, which I think is quite helpful. He says, you know, imagine if you just throw a ton of strawberries in a blender and you just puree them up and then you drink pure strawberry puree. Okay that's like hard jhana. Okay. You, no question about the taste of strawberry in this pure strawberry puree. But what if he said you, you take a little bit of that puree, the sort of essence of strawberry, and you put it then into the blender with a, a few cups of water and you blend it up and you hand that cup to someone and say, Hey, taste this. What does this taste like? What do you think they're going to taste? Strawberry. If they know what strawberry tastes like, they're going to be able to identify the taste of strawberry. And that's similar to light jhana, even though you could say in a way it's lighter jhana is a watered down version of the pure essence of jhana. It doesn't mean we can't detect the pattern or the flavor of the jhana. When we learn how to detect the flavor, we can experience it at any level of depth. So this is the depth dimension of jhana. The next dimension I want to introduce here is the breadth dimension. So if depth exists on the vertical axis here, breadth would be on the horizontal axis. 
And what I mean by breadth is I mean moving from more exclusive to more inclusive breadth of experience. And what does this mean? Well, I'll, again, I'll, I'll reference Brian Newman's experience in the interview we recorded called Nut Job Jana, which you're welcome to listen to. It's um, posted here in the Jana community and also on the Buddhist Geeks podcast. And in that interview, as I was asking Brian questions about his experience, he mentioned that the kind of jhana he was trained in, in addition to being extremely deep and hard, uh, also was very exclusive. And he said, if you were to take a gun and put it right next to my head while I'm in the middle of a jhana and you shoot it, I wouldn't even flinch. Of course, I don't think he actually tested that out, <laughs> but you know, he knows from his own experience, from hearing things in the environment or whatever things happening that he just didn't, not aware of those things. It's, that's how deeply exclusive the estate of the of jhana was to the exclusion of all else in the external environment. That's what I mean by exclusive. Whereas with an inclusive jhana, one would actually be focused on a type of experience that includes all of the external reality in the state. So not only your own experience, but the experience of others, if there are others present, the experience of the environment, sounds, sights, smells, taste, touch, etc. It would include all of those external phenomena in the state. That's an inclusive jhana. So here now we have the full jhana matrix on the vertical axis. We have depth on the horizontal axis, breadth. And we have four quadrants basically that emerge where you could talk about the jhana in terms of there being both exclusive hard jhana, which is kind of like the what Brian described in the Pa'ak tradition, and which is typified most in the Buddhist tradition by what's called the Vasudhimaga. It's a commentarial text and meditation manual that was written some thousand plus years after the time of the historical Buddha. And this is the kind of jhana that they were really celebrated. I've heard, I forget who it was, maybe Lee Brasington, another uh, contemporary teacher. He talked about how you can imagine you have a bunch of dudes because the early Buddhist monasticism were mostly men, except for a brief period where women were invited into the order during the Buddhist time, thanks to his attendant, Ananda. Aside from that, you had a very conservative male-focused lineage and you can imagine these dudes living in a monastery, meditating all the time and just trying to one up each other for a thousand years. And this is the result. You get this sort of goal of extreme deep jhana that excludes everything. It's like total self-absorption would be one way of talking about it. Yeah, that's what you get with a bunch of guys meditating, trying to out meditate each other for a thousand years that are also monastic, they're renunciatives, right? They, they want to remove themselves from the world. And then on the bottom end, you have the soft exclusive jhana. So you could still invite a kind of concentration that excludes your outside environment. Say you're sitting by yourself and you just start to focus on the breath or whatever, and you're trying to kind of disconnect from the outside world, from others, and just kind of go inward to introspect. But you might not go extremely deep. Like you might have an experience of the first jhana that lasts for like a minute or two and feels pretty good. It's like tingly, but you're still thinking, you still feel your body. You're still aware of your, your environment. So you haven't excluded everything extremely, but it is a more exclusive focus and it's softer. Okay. That's definitely a very real possibility. I think that's actually what most meditators experience that do concentration meditation by themselves is this kind of soft and exclusive form of concentration. I'll go over now to the lower right quadrant in this model, which is the soft and inclusive. So we're still at a kind of lower level of depth. But now we've moved toward a jhana that's more inclusive, meaning it includes more of the external world inside itself. Multiplayer meditation is inherently, by the design of the approach, a more inclusive breadth of focus. You have to, in order to do the technique properly, be aware of other people. And this is actually a good thing, I would argue. This is an important thing because. 
when we only train in exclusive attention, we're not, we don't become very good at being able to work with our external world in a contemplative way with attention. Uh, we actually create this kind of split between our contemplative lives and our, our, the rest of our lives, which is fine if you're a renunciative. You know, if, you're, if all you do is just meditate uh, and you don't have to deal with many people or you live in a cave or whatever, uh, that actually might be fine, might not be a problem. But if like me, you know, I, I was doing a lot of retreat practice, in my, especially in my 20s, and I found uh, it very, very difficult to come back from a two month long retreat where I had been in silence and hadn't talked to anyone except my teachers a few times, hadn't made eye contact even with people. And then suddenly I'm back with my girlfriend and I've got to, got to go back to work. And all of a sudden, like, how in the world do I you know, live in both of these realities? How do I bridge the gap between them? Well, multiplayer meditation in a way was designed to do just that. Um, that's part of the reason uh, I found it so helpful because it helped me bridge that gap and include others in my awareness. So a soft, inclusive jhana would uh, necessarily include others. Uh, you would experience the jhanic flavor uh, of, say, the first, second, third, fourth, et cetera, jhana. Uh, and you'd still be able to talk, still be able to connect, still be able to recognize what's happening in your environment, et cetera, because it's not so deep that your your whole reality has turned into something totally different. Uh, alien and foreign, you know, to, to, to your, your normal reality. Okay. It's also possible now to have a deep and inclusive experience of jhana. Uh, I've experienced this in multiplayer meditation where uh, one goes extremely deep into a, a, an altered state of consciousness. This is how you know you're on the deep end of the jhana pool, whether it's inclusive or exclusive, you, you enter into an obviously altered state. It's not, there's no question. It's like you're tripping. If you've ever tripped, you've done psychedelics. It's like taking a heroic dose. Okay. And you can get to the same trippy places through, me through meditation. Uh, I, I did meditation first before I tried psychedelics. So when I tried psychedelics, I was like, oh yeah, I've been there, done that. I, I spent a month there actually, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, uh, so it's like, okay, yeah, no, no big deal. That's cool. I'm glad I can, you know, take some mushrooms and be able to access you know, the depth of a month long retreat, you know, uh, it's also st super destabilizing and a lot easier to integrate on retreat, but still, nonetheless, it's cool that, that this psychotechnology exists. Uh, but it is possible to have this very inclusive experience of jhana that's very altered and very deep in which you're still connected to others. I remember actually, this is a psychedelic story. I was, uh, tripping with a friend named Mikey Siegel in his cabin out in Santa Cruz many years ago. He talked about this publicly, so I'm, I'm not outing him here. He, we've talked about it in public. Um, and we had this very interesting experience of what we both described as a mind meld, uh, uh, in which we, our minds and bodies synced up to such a degree that our thoughts, feelings, and even breath were all synchronized from what we could tell. And we were totally aware of each other, even as we went into the depth of this very, to the K hole, as they call it, this deep ketamine experience. And we just merged into one mind. I think this is how the other thing you're going to notice in the deep end of jhana, whether it's inclusive or exclusive, it's, is, the, is a kind of oneness or a kind of unitive experience that's quite mystical. So it is possible to become one with everyone in a way where you're aware of everyone. And in, in a certain kind of sense, you're in relation to everyone. It's not excluding anything. Um, and this is profound, a profound experience. Uh, can be just as profound, I'd say, as exclusive jhana. And, and so what, what I guess I'm saying here is that, you know, Brian is teaching the more exclusive form of jhana, and I'm teaching a more inclusive form of jhana. Brian's emphasizing depth. I think depth matters, and I value depth, but I also think it's important that people just be able to uh, function in their lives <laughs> and not just be like dissociated contemplatives as I've done, <laughs> you know? Uh, so that's why I emphasize inclusivity and why I don't think the depth is as important as making sure that whatever depth you're at, you're integrating it as you go onto the path. 